Welcome to Tech Tips. I am Dan Featherstone and today we'll be discussing the impeller of a centrifugal pump. So with that, click anywhere on this slide and let's The impeller is the key to the centrifugal pump. It is the only moving part and the only part which transfers the energy of the driver into the system. Understanding how it works and what can go wrong with it is the key to maintaining a well-running pump system. There are three basic types of impellers. The left two are shown in enclosed impeller, meaning that there is a shroud on both sides and that the water flow is very much controlled throughout the impeller and pump. But this also means that it's not really good for handling solids and debris. This impeller is very typical of many centrifugal pumps and jet pumps. The next impeller, or middle one if you choose, is a semi-enclosed impeller and is typical of a sump pump, trash pump, affluent, and sewage pumps. This type of impeller can handle some debris and solids depending upon the overall design of the pump. The impeller to the right is a propeller or an open impeller. This type of impeller design is used for high flow typically, often to transfer water and can handle solids and debris. The flow through the impeller is controlled by two factors. The first being the diameter of the eye of the impeller with the system design keeping the water flow on the suction side less than 5 feet per second. The second factor is the port width where the water exits. The eye of the impeller and the ports can be affected by wear, cavitation, and overheating. How can you overheat an impeller? First remember that the smaller horsepower pumps, the impeller is often plastic, for example, in most of our jet pumps. Knowing this, if the pump is running to a deadhead condition, the water can in fact heat up enough to soften this plastic and cause the ports to collapse thus pinching off the production and flow. Damage and wear to the impeller will often affect the pump's ability to build pressure, whereas deadhead or heat will often cause more of a flow issue as well as a pressure issue. The radius of the impeller imparts velocity onto the water. The eye of the impeller spins counterclockwise or anticlockwise in a two-pole motor at about 3450 RPM. The impeller's radius directly influences the velocity of the water. The outer radius, which is still spinning at 3450 RPM, but must travel at a greater velocity in order to cover the same distance. The further you are away from the eye of the impeller, the greater the velocity. Now you can change the velocity in a few ways by changing the radius. One is by trimming the impeller or cutting down this radius. This will lower the velocity, and thus lower the energy. The lines above the impeller are an attempt to show you this relationship. The greater the radius, the higher the velocity. You can also trim an impeller by damaging it. This is done by cavitation damage accidentally, and again affects the velocity of the water, thus lowering the energy in the system. Another way to change the velocity, though, is by RPM, and that is for a different discussion. So we understand the impeller's radius gives the water velocity but what creates the pressure? This is achieved by using Bermuda's principle. To simply put it, water in an enclosed system has an inverse relationship. When the velocity of the water is allowed to go down, pressure must go up. When the velocity goes up, the pressure must go down. So as the water enters the volute case or diffuser at a high velocity and is allowed to slow down by flowing through an opening that is gradually widening, this will cause the velocity to go down, thus the pressure must go up. Remember again, velocity and pressure are opposite relationships in an enclosed system. So one surefire way to destroy an impeller or to damage it is cavitation. But what is cavitation? Cavitation, simply put, is boiling water at the temperature the water enters the pump at. Literally, we're flashing from a water liquid state to a vapor back to a liquid state. Moreover, this is water vapor and not air. If it were air, it would not have the energy to do the damage that this vapor bubble collapsing does to the impeller. Looking at this chart, you will see that the less atmospheric pressure, the lower the temperature that water needs to boil at. In addition, there is a real low pressure zone in the water system. Yes, you guessed it, the eye of the impeller. That is what's moving the water to create a low pressure point for the water to be pulled into the system. And to do so faster than the design of the system will create this dangerous low pressure zone.
that will cause so much damage. Water is moving into the impeller and the pressure and the velocity is at such a rate that the water cannot stay in its liquid form. It then flashes the vapor. Then as the water and the vapor travel down the system or the impeller, the vapor and the bubbles collapse, releasing that energy. In cast iron, it will work hard in the metal and punch holes in it. Bronze being a softer metal will smear, look like it's been worked or cut apart. Stainless steel will eventually shatter. Plastic impellers will often separate. Often people will mistakenly think that they fell apart or that the glue came apart. So how can you tell if you are cavitating? Often you can hear it. More importantly, if you have a valve on the discharge, you can turn the valve in slowly, reducing the flow or the production, and the noise seems to go away or will get softer. Opening the valve back up again and the noise increases. In a sense, you can play with the noise. Another key thing to understand about a system is net positive suction head required. So what is that? Net positive suction head can be one of the more difficult things to wrap your head around and very difficult to explain. Net positive suction head required is the amount of atmospheric pressure required to keep the water in a liquid state when pumping through a pump to avoid cavitation and breaking of suction. Now the good news is the factory will determine this number. We don't have to worry about it. And the factory will report it on the pump curve. It's also accepted in our industry that we have 25 feet of net positive suction head available. Now an engineer or some factories might tell you 27 feet, but for our example, we're gonna use 25 feet. So if I have a submersible pump that requires 28 feet, that's telling me I have 25 feet, but I have a deficit of an extra three feet that I must submerge the first impeller or the inlet, if you will, below the pumping level three feet to ensure I keep that water in a liquid form. Now, also notice I said pumping level, not the static water level. We have to take into account drawdown. So we have to make sure we submerge it. Now, this is also not submergence to avoid air and whirlpooling. This is for cavitation purposes and for not breaking of suction. Another example, we have a centrifugal pump that requires 16 feet of net positive suction head required. So knowing we have 25 feet to work with, we take away 16 feet, that gives me nine feet of difference. So that nine feet I have left over, I also have to account for my friction losses. And let's say they're pretty heavy. Let's say I have three feet of friction loss included. So 16 plus three now becomes 19 feet of head loss. I have 25. That means that remainder of six feet, that's how close or closer my pump must be to the drawdown level of the water supply. I know that was a lot to take in. Here's another way to view it. Where is that cavitation damage happening? If it is on the periphery of the impeller, that is an issue of running too far right on the pump curve, meaning use that valve we discussed earlier on that discharge to slow down the flow, move it back to the center of the curve. If it is on the eye of the impeller, then you need to review net positive suction head required and examine the system and the water levels, both static and pumping level. For a submersible, it might mean you need to set it deeper. A centrifugal, you might need to get it closer to the water supply or to re-examine your suction and your friction losses. To recap, the impeller is the only moving part in a centrifugal pump imparting velocity onto the water that can be used to create flow by converting velocity into pressure. To protect the impeller, the velocity of the water and the placement of fitting should be carefully considered. On the discharge, it is recommended to have a valve to control the flow and to limit cavitation. Too often, a system is designed to fail, but could have been easily corrected with that valve. With that, I thank you and have a great day. Take care and be kind to each other out there.